the record. So the topic today is one-sided limits. And what is a one-sided limit? Well, let's, let's review what we mean when we talk about the limit as x approaches c of f of x. What are we doing when we take this limit? Well, we're letting x get closer and closer to c. And we're asking ourselves what f of x is doing as x gets closer and closer to c. But the point I want to make here is that x, as it gets close to c, x can be greater than c or x can be less than c. And it shouldn't matter whether x is greater than c or less than c in terms of the limit. So for example, you could take the limit as x approaches one of x squared minus x plus three. And this is a polynomial. So to take this limit, we just plug one in there. One squared minus one plus three. That limit is three. And the point I want to make here, though, let's look at this uh, limit sort of via table, the way we were doing the first uh, few days of class. Sorry, fighting with our technology here. And I know my online students aren't currently seeing anything. F of x equals x squared minus x plus three. And now that we've, uh, we've fought that into submission, we can take a look at this. And the only point I'm trying to make that was maybe a, quite a fight for a kind of easy point to make is that as x approaches one, it can be approaching one from either direction. And these values of f of x are approaching the limit. So we can approach one from below. We can start to the left of one on the number line and then move right. Or we could start to the right of one on the number line and move left. And either way, these numbers are approaching the limit. These numbers are approaching three. Well, there are situations where you don't want to approach C, C being that number here. There are situations where you don't want to approach it from both directions. And 
it's fairly easy to give real life examples of this. We can look at the area of a circle, for example. So here R is a radius, and this function is giving the area of a circle with that radius. And the radius of a circle is strictly positive, can't be negative, can't be zero. You can ask, however, what happens, come on, there we go. You can ask what happens as the radius shrinks to zero. So once again, can't ask what happens at zero, can happen what happens as R gets close to zero. And what I've just described sounds like a limit. I'm basically asking what's the limit as R approaches zero of A of R. But here, R can really only approach zero from one direction, right? I mean, putting aside the formula from a kind of real world point of view, R is always greater than zero. So unlike back here with a general limit, where your variable can be greater than C or your variable can be less than C, here R must be greater than zero. And there are mathematical situations as well, where you want to insist that your variable is greater than C or less than C. So as a purely mathematical situation, we could look at f of x equals the square root of x. And we are not working with complex numbers ever during this course. So if we've got the square root of x, Give me a second, I'm going to close that door. If we've got the square root of X, X cannot be negative. X is greater than or equal to zero. So if you want to write, if you want to ask, What's the limit as X approaches zero of the square root of X? That's a problem, the way we've defined the limit. Because the way we've defined the limit, X should be able to be less than zero and increasing towards it or X should be able to be greater than zero and decreasing towards it. But again, we have in fact a restriction 
in the previous example, it was for real world reasons involving the radius. In this example, it's for mathematical reasons. The square root has, I mean, x has to be positive. But in both of these situations, if we're letting x approach zero, x can only do it, or r approach zero, as the case may be. It can only do it from one direction. And this gives us the idea of a one-sided limit. And a one-sided limit, speaking informally, but I hope clearly, a one-sided limit is, well, it's a limit. We're letting our variable get close to C, and we're seeing what happens. And however, a one-sided limit has the property that X only approaches C, from one direction. Let's get our notation nailed down. For one sided limits, our notation is almost the same as our notation for two-sided limits, but we're going to put either a positive or a negative sign next to C in the superscript of C. And let's start with the limit as X approaches C with a plus symbol in that superscript. This is called a right-hand limit. And the right-hand limit is the limit but instead of X being able to approach C from both directions, X is always going to be greater than C. And the right-hand limit is exactly what we need to deal with both the examples we just looked at. Here, X is approaching zero, but X can't be negative. So X has to be greater than zero. So to make X be greater than zero, rather than take a limit, we take a right-hand limit. Here, switching our variable, but R is approaching zero, but R has to be positive. R has to be greater than zero. So to make R be positive, to make R be greater than zero, we can take a right-hand limit. right hand because if you draw the number line and here's C, then being greater than C means you're to the right of C on the number line. 
And you can probably sort of guess how the left hand limit is going to go. Maybe we want X to approach C. But we want X always to be less than C. Then instead of a positive sign, we put a negative sign. And we call that the left-hand limit, and the left-hand limit is the limit, but x always has to be less than c. And we can, just like we came up with with the radius, we can come up with real world examples for a left hand limit. This example is going to be kind of more obscure, but let's see. We probably know from Star Trek or cultural osmosis that um, objects masses change when their velocity gets near to light speed. That's the theory of relativity, or that's part of the theory of relativity. So we can define a function that gives the mass of a quickly moving object as a function of its velocity. And you can ask, so this notation might be a little confusing. See, I've, um, I've mostly been using C just as kind of a dummy letter, but C is the standard letter for light speed. So you can ask what happens to the mass of an object as it accelerates to light speed. And now again, sort of just relying on cultural osmosis for everyone to know this, but objects with mass cannot move faster than light. So you can ask what happens as the mass approach. Sorry, I uh, watched that slightly. It's the velocity that's changing. You can ask what happens as the velocity approaches light speed. But the velocity is always stuck below light speed. So if you want to ask what happens as the velocity approaches C, you should be asking what happens as the velocity is below C and accelerating towards it. In other words, you should be asking for the left hand limit. And again, left hand, because if this is C and the object's velocity is less than C, it's to the left of it on the number line. So those are the right and left-hand limits. And in one sense, we have sort of little to say about them. We find these one-sided limits just 
line, line, we find two sided limits. So suppose, for example, we want the limit as X approaches two from the left of a polynomial of X squared plus five X minus one. If this weren't a one-sided limit, if this were a regular limit, then we would just plug two in there. Remember that polynomials have that property. To find the limit, you just take this number and you plug it into the polynomial. And what I've just said is that we find one-sided limits in just the same way. So to find this one-sided limit, we take two and we plug it into the polynomial. Four plus 10, minus one should be 13. So since you've um, taken the quiz and you've done these examples, you should be able to find a one-sided limit for me. Let's have you find the limit as X approaches two from the right of X squared minus four X plus four divided by X minus two. I'm going to ask you to do this and again the hint, as it were, is that you find one-sided limits just the way you find two-sided limits. So the trick you used to do problems like this in the quiz continues to work for this one-sided limit. Maybe we should get going. So the, the trick I suggested while I was wandering around the room was that if we have a rational function, that is to say, if we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial, and we can't just stick two in there. We get zero divided by zero. We get a division by zero error. We should try factoring the rational functions and then canceling terms. And we wind up with the limit of a polynomial, the one-sided limit of a polynomial, I should say. But we find this in just the same way as a two-sided limit. We just plug that two in there and we end up with a zero. So finding one-sided limits is done, just like finding two-sided limits. Let me give an anticipation for the next thing 
we're going to talk about. Let me give a slightly more complicated example. Let's find the one-sided limit of a piecewise defined function. Let's find the limit as X approaches one from below. of a function that is this, when X is less than or equal to one and this, when X is strictly greater than one. Well, what makes this complicated or what makes this seemingly more complicated is the fact that we don't just have a single equation here. We have two equations and which equation we use depends on where X is. If x is less than or equal to one, we're using the first equation. If x is greater than one, we're using the second equation. Well, x is approaching one. And if this were a two-sided limit, the complication would be that we wouldn't be able to just use one of the formulas. If this were a regular limit, we'd have to ask what happens when X is less than one. And we'd have to ask what happens when X is greater than one. But because this is a one-sided limit, that complication doesn't arise. We're approaching one from the left, meaning that X is always less than or equal to one, meaning that we're always using that formula. And to find the limit, as X approaches one from the left, well, finding the one-sided limit is just like finding the two-sided limit. This is a rational function. It's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. We, this time, unlike that problem I gave you to look at, we don't get any kind of division by zero error. We can just let X be one. And we wind up with five divided by one, which is five. Okay, let's state an important and well, quest. does anybody have any questions before we go on? Then let's state an important uh, and useful theorem of one-sided limits theorem. The regular limit, the limit as X approaches C of F of X might or might not exist. So this theorem is a theorem of existence. It's telling you whether this regular 
I've used this phrase already, but if we want to distinguish a regular limit from a one-sided limit, we can call it a two-sided limit. This two-sided limit exists if and only if that great mathematical phrase one for the two sided limit to exist, the one sided limits must exist. And resources approved. Um, so the one-sided limits have to both exist and existing isn't enough. The one-sided limits have to be equal. to each other. And this theorem gets used a lot when we have, um, when we're looking at examples involving piecewise defined functions, like, We'll use this theorem extensively in the next section. For now, let's look at an example of this theorem. It will just be a purely mathematical example. Let's say that f of x is 2x minus 3 when x is less than or equal to 2 and it's x minus 1 when x is greater than two. And let's ask, does the limit as X approaches two of F of X exist? And if it does, exist what is it it's not at all obvious that this limit exists first of all and let's just talk about that a little let's make sure we're all on the same page here one of the reasons that a limit might not exist is if there is a jump in the graph. So what might be happening here is that we've got x equals two and on the left and on the right hand side, we have linear functions, we have straight lines, but 
Maybe the graph looks something like this, because two is where we change functions. Two is where we go from having this straight line to having a different straight line. And if we had a graph like this, the limit that two would not exist. So do we have a graph like this? Well, let's go back to this theorem. This theorem says we can find the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. And if those limits exist and they are the same, then the two-sided limit exists. And finding the one-sided limits is fairly straightforward. We can ask what happens when X is less than two. Uh, again, I sort of wish there were a way I knew to copy frames quickly. We can ask what happens when X is less than two. And if X is less than two, we're in the first piece. And we're taking the limit of two X minus three. And this is a polynomial. It's a first degree polynomial, a uh, linear equation. And we take this limit just by plugging two right in there. Limits of polynomials are straightforward. Do be a little careful. I know it can sometimes happen. You see that negative sign and maybe you're working a little too quickly and you plug negative two in there. So don't do that. This is positive two approached from the left. What if we approach to from the right? Well, if we approach to from the right, then X is greater than two, and we're in the second piece of this function. And we're if we're in the second piece, let me copy this down, then f of x is x minus one. This is a polynomial. We take this limit just by plugging that two in there and we get one. So these limits are equal. These one-sided limits are equal. And the two-sided limit exists. And um, I asked for us to find the two-sided limit. And I haven't explicitly written down how to do that, but maybe we can intuit it if the left-hand limit is one and the right-hand limit is one, then the two-sided limit is also one. 
So if these two-sided limits, if the, sorry, if these one-sided limits are the same, then that common value is the two-sided limit. Um, I know these examples probably seem very artificial. Um, stuff like this shows up fairly common, at least in business. And I know that most of you aren't business majors, but like stuff like taxes, um, the amount of income tax you pay is usually some kind of piecewise defined function. Or if you pay less than a certain amount, you're in one piece called a bracket. And if you pay more than a certain amount, you're in another bracket and so on. So this stuff does show up in real world situations. It's not just a toy. Um, this being a math class, we're just kind of presenting it mathematically. There is an application of this, uh, not in this assignment, but in the next assignment. Let me, by the way, since we have the smokes up, let me take a look at this. I'm claiming that this two-sided limit exists. So I'm claiming that at two, there isn't any kind of jump. I, let me try to move, what? This most disappeared. Let me try to move stuff around a little. Here we go. Let's look at this function. 2x minus 3 when x is less than or equal to 2. So this when x is less than or equal to 2. x minus 1 when x is greater than 2. And you see there isn't any jump. We just, we're in one piece, then we're in a different, let me, uh, let me quickly share this so that online students can see it. As I was saying, there isn't any jump here. We're in this piece, we hit this joint and then we're in the other piece. There is nothing like what I have pictured here. There isn't any sort of jump like that. So this one-sided limit section has kind of a coda. I like the textbook fine or I wouldn't be using it, but it does occasionally present stuff in kind of a weird way. I'm just going to present a limit to you. And when you see this limit, you are going to probably ask yourself, what does this have to do with anything we've been talking about this class period? And the answer is nothing really. It's a two-sided limit that the textbook kind of stuck in here. So this is where Al presented as well. The limit as theta approaches zero of the sine of theta divided by theta equals one. 
This limit is not at all obvious. If you just stick theta in there, you get zero divided by zero. You can't find this limit that way. And I mean, I guess the real answer to why the textbook presents it here is that if we wanted to formally demonstrate that this limit statement is true, we would do it with a kind of ugly and complicated argument involving one-sided limits. I am opposed to ugly and complicated arguments, at least when they can possibly be avoided. So I'm just going to show you a picture. New share, get that calculator back. The sine of x divided by x. Here is one. And as we're getting closer and closer to zero, y is getting closer and closer to one. And that's true as we approach zero from the right and as we approach zero from the left. So what is this limit? I mean, why am I showing this to you? Um, this is a limit that pops up actually fairly frequently in applications of mathematics. And the reason it shows up fairly frequently is that the sign is complicated. It's got this weird definition in terms of the unit circle. It's a hassle to work with. This limit says that if theta is close to zero, so when would a fraction be one? Or when would a fraction be close to one? A fraction would be close to one if the numerator and the denominator were approximately equal. That squiggly equality is our approximately equal to button. And what this means is that if you are working with angles, let me just write this down. If you are working, with angles, and those angles are very close to zero, you can use theta to a the sign of theta. So I don't know if this is really going to come up in calculus, but it comes up in applications as diverse as astronomy, and um, it shows up in optics a lot. Let's see, there was something. No, I've lost it. If there was, oh, right. I just wanted to actually to point out a lot of calculus, a lot of the optics.
applications of calculus are approximating things. You maybe wouldn't guess that from like trigonometry, where you memorize the sine of pi over four or whatever, instead of just plugging it into a cultivator and getting a decimal approximation. But cultivus is a great field for approximation. And this Equality is a tool of approximation. It says that because a fraction is close to one, only when the numerator and the denominator are approximately equal, this limit yields that statement. And now I'm not strictly speaking over because of the way this class schedule is, but I am done with this section and certainly not inclined to start another one in the 15 minutes we have left.